Good evening. Good to be in God's house Amen. on a Sunday night, no less. Amen. Seems a little strange, doesn't it? <laughs> but it seems good. Appreciate you cutting your nap short uh, after having a year to sleep as long as you wanted to. Coming out to God's house tonight, especially you, Arthur. I know you cut at least an hour off. <laughs> Who's got an object of prayer you'd like to mention this evening? I remember Diane a while. Well, maybe. I think you remember when we young, and I've got other options. <coughs> Just pray that every one of these open views will be filled. Be the Lord. Continue remember Lee and I, she spent a week at Baptist Hospital and uh, had a lot of surgery on his uh, arm and front part of his body, but uh, he's still in a lot of pain. He got to come home, but uh, he's going to be a long time to heal and so keep him here again. Remember all these night. Pray God's will be done here in the service for you and me. All it can and will. Let's come pray. All right, let's turn back to Luke chapter 15 tonight. Luke 
Luke chapter 15. And we will begin reading in verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto, un, unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. He answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should, should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word tonight. We'll finish up our message that we started this morning about the other prodigal son. As we said, there are two prodigal sons in this paragraph. We normally only focus on the first one. I imagine most every message you've ever heard on the prodigal son probably ended at verse 24. Um, we started at verse 25 tonight. And I uh, said this morning this could really be called the parable of the prodigal sons because there are two, not just one, uh, that wander away here in this story that the Lord told. And we saw that the second, the elder son, that he was a prodigal for a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it was because he was dedicated and not devoted. He was about his father's business. He was doing the right things. He was in the right place, but he wasn't doing them for the right reason. He didn't have the right attitude in his heart. Uh, we said that what God wants from us is not dedication. He doesn't want dedicated people. He wants devoted he wants my devotion, and he wants your devotion. He wants us to do all that we do for him out of love, for it to all be motivated by our love for him. It should come from our devotion, just like it did the Apostle Paul. We saw also another issue with him that caused his waywardness was he spent some time complaining. He complained about uh, how he had been overlooked and how, the way that he had been treated. And he was also very critical. He criticized his younger brother and pointed out his faults. There was no real compassion about him. When his brother comes home, he's not happy. He's not glad to see him. He's not thankful that his brother has uh, come back safe and sound. No, he becomes angry. He gets angry when he hears the news, when he finds out what the dancing and the music is all about. Well, we're going to look at one other problem that this elder son had, and that was he was fundamental but not forgiving. He was fundamental but not forgiving. Verse 30. It says, But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. So another one of his problems was that he was very rigid in his beliefs. He was fundamental. Now you'll notice that everything he says about his younger brother was basically true. Right? I mean, he's telling the truth. Uh, it was true that he had devoured the portion of his father's inheritance that he had divided into it. That was right. And we can probably assume that the elder son uh, had saved his portion that uh, his father had given to him. For you see, both of them had received their inheritance. Uh, verse 12 tells us that. When the younger son went and asked for the father to give him his portion of the goods, 
He gave it to both of them at the same time. Uh, and so he divided his living up among both of them. But while the younger brother had squandered his, the elder most likely had saved his and maybe even uh, paid back a portion of it by working faithfully in his father's field. So once again, he shows himself to be the more responsible son, the more reliable of the two. And it was also true that the younger son had wasted his father's goods on wild living and wild women. Harlots, his older brother says, uh, on sinful pleasures. He was a bad boy, you could say. All the while the elder son had been out working in his father's field, serving him every day, uh, diligently and faithfully. Not only had he not wasted his inheritance, but like we said, he'd paid part of it back. He was a good boy. So essentially, he's right in what he's saying about his brother. His beliefs were accurate and they were correct. But the problem was that somehow he felt that being right made him better than his brother and more deserving as well. And he voiced his displeasure over the lack of appreciation that he had been shown for being so good, being such a good uh, and faithful son. And he was careful to point out to his father the fact that you never killed the fatted calf for me. You never threw a party for me. I've been good. I've been the good one here. I've done all the right things. While my brother has gone out and shamed us all, and yet as soon as he comes back, what happens? What do you do? Does he get punished for his disobedience? Do you even so much as reprimand him for leaving home? No. You act like it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. You put the best robe we've got on. You put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And you throw him this big party. Uh, this big welcome home party. What's up with that? I can hear him say. It's not fair. It's not right. What has he done to deserve being treated so well? Why don't you punish him instead? Well, the father never argues with him. Never disagrees with him. And that's because he knows he's right. He's telling the truth. At least to some degree. And what he was saying. It would have been easy to have been ashamed of the younger son. Uh, would have been very justified for the father to have punished him severely. And to have even turned him away altogether. And said, I'm sorry. You messed up. You can't come back home. You'll have to go somewhere else. And so you see there is a danger that comes from being right. Did you know that? There is. And the danger is you can forget to be merciful to the ones who are wrong. You can forget to be gracious to those who are wrong or who we see as being wrong. Jesus called this the righteousness of the Pharisees. That's where you say and you do all the right things except the most important thing of all. And that is to love God with all your heart and to love your fellow man as yourself. You miss that part. Where you fail to love them the way that God loves them. Fail to forgive like God forgives. There's a danger in that. And it's especially dangerous for people like us. I'm preaching a new hope tonight. People who belong to a fundamental Baptist church. Because we all know that Baptists are right, right? Yes, sir. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God, and we're right. We believe that the only way to know the difference between right and wrong is by what God says, and we're right. We also believe 
that unless a person repents of their sins and receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they will perish and that they will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we're right. Absolutely, we're right. But if we're not careful, folks, we'll wind up like this elder son. And we'll start thinking that just because we're right, that also makes us better than other people. That we're good and they're bad. We'll forget that we were once in their shoes. We'll forget that we were once in the same position and the same condition that they are. We'll forget that ultimately we're a sinner too. And that the only real difference between us and them is that we have accepted and experienced God's grace in our lives and they have not. The only real difference is that we're a saved sinner and they're a lost sinner. And that's it. And if we ever get to the point that we are so filled by self-righteousness that we start looking down upon others, Folks, we will have forgotten what being a Christian is all about. We will. It's not about condemning people. It's about converting people from their wicked ways. Our job is not to reject them who live in sin. It is to rescue them and to reach them for Jesus Christ. And when one of our brethren should stumble and fall, as they surely will, what do we do? Our attitude shouldn't be to run them down. Did you hear what so-and-so did? Did you hear what's going on with them? Hmm. Our desire should be to do anything that we possibly can to restore such a one into full fellowship with Christ and with the church. We cannot take the approach, oh boy, they messed up. So, sorry, but you can't be here. We can't have you embarrassing us like that. I hate it, but you're just going to have to hit the road. You're not welcome here anymore. That is about as far from a Christ-like attitude as you can get. And Jesus showed us that. When they brought him, when they brought to him the woman that had been taken in adultery. All those fundamental people. Remember? They brought her and they knew what she had done. They caught her in the act. They knew she was wrong. And so what was their solution? They were going to stone her to death. What did Jesus do? He just bent over and he started writing on the ground. And he said, let he that is without sin cast the first stone. They all went away, didn't they? (laughs) They sure did. They had to go home. He didn't condemn her. And neither should we condemn someone that we know who's taken in a fault. Because but for the grace of God, there go I. There go we. Our job is to share God's love with them. Our job is to show God's forgiveness to a world that desperately needs it. Verse 28 says that the elder son was angry. and He would not join in with his family's rejoicing. Instead, he stayed outside and pouted. I guess he was Baptist after all. He said amen the first time I talked about <laughs> Baptist. Hey, that's not the attitude that God wants us to present to the world around us. Jealousy. That, it doesn't speak of jealousy, but I believe that's what it was. That he was jealous that his brother was getting all the attention, all this 
good things were being put on him and given to him. I want you to know something, folks. Jealousy has absolutely no business in the life of God's people. Doesn't belong. Doesn't belong in our hearts. Doesn't belong in God's house. Because the only thing that jealousy does is divide us. The only thing that jealousy will do is push us apart. It will not bring us together. Can you think of any instance in throughout all of history, where jealousy has brought anybody together. Made them closer. I can't. Yes, they may be wrong and we may be right. But that doesn't mean we're supposed to stone them. Throw stones at them from here. Doesn't mean we're supposed to put them to death. I honestly believe that we could do so much more and be so much more effective if we would spend less time protesting against people and arguing with people and spend more time proclaiming the gospel to people. Those folks, most of them, they know they're wrong. They know what they're doing is wrong. They don't need us to tell them that. But what they do need us to tell them is that there is a God in heaven who loves them anyway. And that God sent His only begotten Son to this world some 2,000 years ago to die on a cruel Roman cross so that they could be forgiven of their sins and receive the gift of eternal life. That's what they need to hear. (laughs) That's what they need to know. And how are they going to know it? Unless they hear it from us. Now look at verse 31. And he said unto him, Son. I love that. He's still his son. He still knows and considers him as his son. He says, Son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is thine. The best part of these two stories is that the father was willing to receive both of them back. No questions asked. Both prodigal sons received nothing but loving forgiveness from their father, did they? So that means it doesn't matter what kind of prodigal you may be. Whether you're the one that openly runs away from God like the younger son did, and that falls into a sinful lifestyle, or if you're like the older one, the kind that just slowly drifts away from God in your heart. Physically, you're still in the, in the right place, but spiritually, you've drifted. Regardless of which one you might be, either way, God wants you back. God will forgive you, and that's the good news of the parable of the prodigal sons. It's good to know that if you've left and went to the far country, that you can come home right now. But it's also good to know that if you never left the house, that if you've been in the house the whole time, out working in the field every day, but you've still wandered from God, you can come home too right now. Now, it isn't clear whether the elder son ever had a change of heart or not. The Lord doesn't say. The story ends. We don't know whether he began to make merry. I'd like to think that he went inside with everybody else and joined in like his father wanted him to. But we don't know that. We don't know if he got glad or he stayed mad. But I know this. It was his decision. It was his choice to make. Sometimes the hardest kind of backsliding to come out of is the kind you can't see or won't see. When you're so sure that you're right, but you don't know you're wrong. And you won't believe that you're wrong. Oh, there's no way that I'm wrong. I'm a Baptist, remember? We're always right. God have to come outside where we are 
and entreat us to come in. If he does, let's go inside. Let's go with him. Father, we love you tonight. And we're so glad that you love us. There's at least two kinds of prodigals in this world, Lord. The kind that openly and visibly leaves home and the kind that only happens on the inside, in our hearts. But either way, we've drifted from you. Lord, it can happen to anybody. It can happen more than once. But it's our choice whether we stay that way or not. We have a decision to make. Can't help but believe, Lord, that as a whole, the church has wandered away from you. We've drifted, God. We're not where we need to be. We're not as close as we once were. Oh, we need to be inside where the fun is, where there's a good time to be had by all. There ain't no good in standing outside missing out. I pray you'll show us that tonight, Lord. We may be stubborn and we can be hard-headed all we want to. Convinced that we're in the right and everybody else is in the wrong. But we're missing out. God, I pray that we won't let that continue. And we won't stay outside. We'll come in with you where you want us to be. I pray that for New Hope Baptist Church. God, you deal with us as a church family, as a body of believers. Yes, this applies to us individually, this story, this parable. But it can apply to us as a church too. Lord, help us to come home to come back to you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll stand. the next verse you've heard the old saying on the outside looking in that's where that elder boy was wasn't it he was missing out party was going on on the inside he knew it was there he knew what was going on he heard the music the dancing they were happy they were making merry the Bible says but he wouldn't go in he just refused. Sometimes being fundamental and being rigid in your beliefs can cause you to miss out. I don't want that for us. I don't want us on the outside looking in. I'm going to be right in the middle of that, don't you? That good time that could be going on, that we could be having. God entreating you, is he entreating us? Come inside. He called him son, we're still saved. Nothing will ever change that. 
but we can miss out. We can't lose our salvation, but we can lose our joy. Let's go inside. You know God's talking to you. He's calling you. Time to come in. When I'm down in the valley, can't see. thank God for being so good to us for being that kind of father that we see in that story he wants us back he'll take us back either way but we've got to come home got to come to ourselves like that younger son did I'm going home or I'm going inside I really hope we'll take this message to heart ponder on it folks I think we need to the day and the time we're living in I think we really need to say, you know, am I where I need to be? Am I where God wants me to be? All right, all hearts and minds clear. Amen. Amen. Doug Johnson, how about closing us in prayer, please, brother? Go with each individual as they go to the designated places, Father, to them safely. Father, lead us down that path that you've chosen for us, Father. Let us open our heart and mind and seek that path through your guidance. Father, let us not become a still connected bunch of people. Let us have joy and hope in the ninth Son of Jesus Christ. He gave us something that no man can push up a son. He gives us power over the grave. Six foot of dirt can hold us when the time is appointed. For it's in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless.